All right, Hector, thank you for doing this, man. Hey, so it's my pleasure. So before the podcast, we were talking about manage and schedule, man, yeah. and we were talking about how you have a system in place, mm -hmm. right? So what's your system like? Well, it actually took me a long time to do it because I was never a man of the system. I was just like, go with the flow. I was an athlete my whole life, so everything was scheduled for me. When right. I was used to like, they tell me what to do, where to go. Um, but yeah, I realized like after having a lifetime of not and then going into being a business owner, like I had to double up. So I do paper and then I double it with an app, an yeah. actual app that I do on my phone. Dude, so I was telling you, man, I, I don't know if it's the omen in me, but I do the same thing. So for like when, I, when we're doing anything that we're doing, whether it's for the academy, so for, you know, for Damio, for Paragon, or for Last Warrior Standing, yeah, I'll, I'll do it on paper. I have a book where I, I write things down and I put my notes and stuff. And mm -hmm. once... It's a clearer vision. Then it goes on the. Then it goes on the phone. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Do you do that. I kind of clean it up in my mind. Yeah. Through the paper, through mm -hmm. the notes, and then once it's, it's a final clear vision, then I put it on the phone, and it absolutely makes sense. You know. It does. Yeah. And, and creating that kind of system. What I do that helps me is like if I know I have tasks to do, I just dump it in a task app, like all in my tasks. So I just write down things I need to do, and then when I go to the plan, I have this list of 10, 15 things, and then I organize it and put it all in there. Was there ever a point where, like, did you get cocky at one point where you're like, I got this, I can remember, I can remember all my appointments, all my things to do? Oh, no. No? Oh, no, I know that as a weakness. I knew it, I knew it. You knew it as a weakness? <laughs> yeah, I, did. I got cocky, man, but it was so funny, man, because it's so crazy how your brain puts things in priority, mm -hmm. and you start forgetting things, man. Like, I, I'll give you an idea. Uh, I had um, like my combination locker, like my com mm. the combination to my locker, something that I've known for 13, 14 <laughs> years, all of a sudden gone, all of a sudden gone out of my brain and I couldn't find it. And I could had I nothing could. written down or anything? No, but, but it was because at the same time I was tracking, I was tracking like five projects at work and like 20 things for the academy and then this other thing over here. And I got space. cocky. Dude, and I got cocky. <laughs> and, well, and it was kind of like my brain was like, okay, you don't really use your locker, so gone, you know? Uh, but you need to tr keep track of all these other things. So next thing you know is I'm staring at my locker <laughs> and I and I start getting mad at myself because, you know, I'm like, dude, there's no, how do I get into this locker and, and how do I forget a combination that I've known for like 13 yep. years, you know? Yep. But it's it's uh, but after that was my lesson. That was my lesson. That's when I started <laughs> writing things down and and yeah. kind of like you know okay I need to I need to create a more um, what do you call it a more organized plan of attack. Yeah, and that's the way I look at it now. Mm -hmm. It's not so much like a calendar, but it's a plan of attack because yeah. it lets me know, like you were saying, it kind of lets me know how much time I'm going to spend on each thing, right? Yeah. So like on the drawing and yep. stuff. And I used to think it was a weakness for some weird reason. Really? I used to think like planning was a weakness. How how was that? What what was that thought I, process? Where, how'd that enter into your brain? I think because it was like maybe it was the machismo or something, but like I can remember this. You know, like why can't you remember it? Why do you have to write it down? Just think about it. Yeah. <laughs> just like just like remember everything. Like you don't need help. Like it was almost I don't know what it was, but it was like I needed help so I was weak kind of thing. Mm. But then there was a switch where I was like well, we all need help. You know, we all need to grow and we're all, we're not all like got it all together. So I was like, all right, I'm doing the planning life. <laughs> right. That's not, it, it makes sense, man. It makes sense. Especially when you have big projects, you were talking about like how much time you spend on drawings. Yeah. So what is that like, man? When somebody comes up to you, um, I'm sure you get all ends of the spectrum of mm -hmm. like, I want an eagle, yeah. you know, as a tattoo. And yeah. you're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is that like, man? What do you, what, what's your, what gets you excited when it comes down to a project and how much time do you allow yourself? For yeah. See, like this? it's, I mean, I have obviously the things that I'm like drawn to stylistically, but I think more so I've, I've taken like a, just a wider approach to viewing just the medium of tattooing. And so whether if it's somebody that wants the, a little script all the way to a full sleeve, like I just want to make sure that personally I can put the amount of effort that's needed. Like if it's a script, I just want to make sure it's the right one for them and I'll really focus on the placement, making sure it looks good. But just being able to put, I think, 100% of my effort into just contemplating this idea for that person. 
And I've kind of taken that approach. So it kind of gives me like, no matter what's coming across from me, like I just want to give it the attention that it needs. And so I want the scheduling really helps me out because it, it allows me to do that. Like I'll tell somebody they have a big project and I look at my week and it's busy. I'm like, well, this is going to take two weeks because I need to take time. And if, it, if I have to push stuff back a little farther, I'll do it. Because I'm like, I'm not going to give you an inferior, you know, project or an inferior like or a less less capable me just because I didn't I wanted to jam it in earlier, you know. Right. What's uh, so what's uh, what's going on in your life? Because we were talking about like you were still um, you've you've lived a couple different lives. Right. So <laughs> yeah. we, uh, we 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 were we're a firefighter. Mm-hmm. We're the two artists. But your previous life was as a as a social worker. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> it actually had stemmed from 09 because I was a uh, I was a uh, when the recession hit, yeah. I was actually working full time ministry, and uh, whoa, what? yeah, I was working as a in full time ministry working with athletes, with an organization called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, but when the recession hit, we were a hundred percent funded by donations, so I mm. lost my job in like a weekend. Um, and so from like 09 up until even the fire department, I had just been like on this search again for like, who am I? Like, what do I have to contribute to the world? Like, what is my peace? And really it was like social work was, a, was an area cause I considered doing therapy. That's what I had a bachelor's in, in psychology. Um, but art was always there. Like even when I was a little kid, I had just like, I stuffed it, but it was always there. Art and creativity. What made you stuff it? Um, well, we were even talking a little early, like I grew up in South Tucson. So like my mentality was just a really like survival mentality and, uh, sports was what really like gave me an opportunity to get out and Mm. really gave me, it kind of just gave me more so hope to be able to go to school and do something better with my life. And, uh, at the time, it was art or sports. So I had an opportunity to go to art school or go to s- play football. Right. And I chose football because at the time, I just thought, like, it would take me farther away. Right. <laughs> right. And he was choosing about getting away. But it's so interesting that you mentioned that that survival mindset and how under that mindset, art really doesn't have room yeah. for it. I was, I've been, I was listening to, uh, I was listening to this uh, breakdown on when they think art, music, and religion came to be, appeared in society, in human mm. society. And they were talking about how it was until humans were able to provide for their basic needs, mm. right? Meaning we had shelter, food, security, yeah. uh-huh. uh, a structural in society, some sort of hierarchy in, yeah. in, our, in our community, that we were able to put our spears out and go, okay, who am I and what's my role in this universe? Because prior to that is, where's the food coming yeah, from? Yeah, you have to like Are, we, are we at war and am I starving? Am I going to have to eat my, my neighbor? It looks delicious. <laughs> yeah. I'll eat it. You know, it, it's yeah. true, but it, it was very, it's very, it's a survival mindset. Yeah, that makes sense. But once, uh, I think it's a Manslow, something like that. Have you heard about this? Mm-mm. It's, uh, I think, and I can't remember the correct name, but a uh, good friend of mine, Dr. Augie Romero, um, it's a preacher of this thing, and it's the Manslow hierarchy of needs. And he oh, talks okay. about how it's not till those basic needs are met of are you appreciated, are you safe, mm. um, are you happy, that people can finally start being successful. Wow. Which leads into can you start figuring out what your role in this world is, right? Yeah, that's kind of what happened with the fire department. Yeah? Yeah. Tell me, man. So <clears throat> I had been on this journey. I was trying to do social work. And then uh, the fire department opportunity came up and uh, it was exactly pretty much like what you're saying. Like I wanted something to just be able to provide for the family to, you know, I'd been working all these weird on it jobs just to survive where I was like, okay, if I can get into this, it'll give me something stable. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I was just fortunate. I tried my first time and I was able to get in with TFD. Wow. And so within that first year, I, exactly what you were saying like my needs were provided for i had this stable job i had something providing for my family insurance benefits all the you know bells and whistles and so then i was like this art thing came up again because we had time off and i was like that's who i've always been had you been drawing 
throughout this time periodically periodically like i think more so when i got on the fire department a couple years before i started taking it serious just personal like reading books and looking up stuff online and just going like i love this again like kind of reigniting that childhood like passion right. that was there that's crazy man but one thing that you mentioned was this man i kind of want to go back to your time in a social worker um we were talking about how frustrating it is to be involved in social working yeah, yeah. Um, because you want to get involved in the sense of um, in the sense of we meet people that are going through a crisis mm -hmm. and our idea of being in social work is for me is to give you not a handout but a hand up yeah you know it's I'm here to listen provide whatever need I can or whatever whatever help I can to meet your to meet your needs yeah and see you independent of back to your feet. That's to me, that's the ultimate definition of, of uh, successful interaction with social working. Yeah. But it's not that. Yeah. Well, not, at least not at that across the board. Right? Yeah. And I mean, I just, I can only speak from one facet that I was involved in. Um, but yeah, it, it just started to, it was more like management. Like it was managing people in the sense of like, they're never going to be independent they're never going to be able to thrive on their own so we're just going to manage them and it was just like just administer the spills yeah and i mean yeah. the that's what probably threw me off the most like just how fast they were throwing meds at people right with like a one hour interview they were just popping pills to people and like an ungodly amount of access to medication oh right? it was it's i mean insane and I, I, I don't know for me i know it was like a it was like a catch 22 because like Sometimes you don't know if they're making stuff up just so they can get meds or if they're telling the truth. But, like, whatever they said, they just... Check the box. Check the, the box door. and gave them some pills and then come back to see how they've been working for you. And for me, that just wasn't good enough. Could you see, do you remember a specific case where a person started a physical decline once they get on these pills and, they're, and you have to see them periodically. Oh my gosh, yeah. Like um, Some of the side effects from the pills were worse than what was supposed to help them. So some of these people would just fall into depression or they would go right back to their addictions because they would just have no motivation. Their energy would be zapped. They'd be right. like dehydrated all the time. And uh, yeah, just seeing these people decline, I'd have to take them into the hospital or call the crisis teams and... Uh, yeah, I mean, when you're taking so many medications with so many side effects, it's like, are you helping them in the long run, you know? Because you're right. just, you're piling on stuff that's actually too much for them anyways. Did you ever bring that up to, like, your management where you had a concern about, like, these pills? But, and, and, the, and the reason I'm asking is I've mm -hmm. talked to a lot of people that have been involved in this. And uh, the people that brought up their concerns are just yeah. kind of, like, hushed away. Yeah, I mean, I voiced some stuff. But it was more of like, this is just, this is the system. This is like, the this system. This is the way it is. And it was, I mean, in discussing with people, like that, it just wasn't the way, that way with our organization. Like it was the way across, with the, board. All across the board. And so I was just like, well, I can't be a part of that. Yeah. Like I just can't. Morally, yeah. For me, yeah, I was like, I can't be sitting in these appointments with these psychiatrists and they're just, it's just pill management, you know, med oh, management. And that I was insane. like. You know, I'm curious where that's going to go because there's there's major big pharmaceutical companies that have, that have recently lost lawsuits mm. for billions of dollars. I haven't Here heard of that, but I would yeah. hope so. Um, well, I can't remember which state. Um, I can't remember which state um, just recently lost or, or the state won. They sued a pharmaceutical company, and I believe it was for Oxycontin, and just because of a number of deaths that happened in that state and the lawsuit went through and they won um, and the lawsuit the lawsuit went through and they won and I think it was about half a billion dollars Gosh, and the money is going to go to um, the, mo the money is going to go to actually towards the state to manage addiction mm. in a different way you know I to, think to it's try to get them I think it's so needed yeah those, those pharmaceutical companies they bank on just popping the pill so well, it's gross yeah. that they operate, man, because they, the way they do it is they show up, they have this the sales rep, right? And what they do is they show up with baskets of food and gifts to the offices, right? Like if you meet people that work as the sales representatives, that's yeah. their job. And their job is to like just lure this, you know, offices into, hey, 
we have this bill that we want in the market and there's a lot of incentives if we start pushing it through. And then there's vacations and next thing you know, and if you're a doctor, man, you find yourself in a in a yacht in the oh middle of Pacific, gosh. you know, paid for by by Couldn't big do pharma. it, man. I couldn't do I, it. You couldn't do it morally, <laughs> but there's people that don't have the morality yeah. to them, you know, that don't have the morality. It, it, and it's just, and it's just, you know, when you've, I mean, it's, dude, to be a doctor, man, it's insane. It's like you're talking about a decade worth of schooling yeah. and a decade of successful practice just to get out of debt. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say a decade of debt as well, debt. tied to that thing. Right. Is, and, and then post that, so 20 years post school or post uh, graduation, then you can finally start seeing money. Yeah. So you have these guys that are barely making ends meet, but they have a, doc, they have a doctor degree to them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Living next door to you in your apartment. Uh, you it's know. that survival mentality, man. Right. It, and it how, do you, how do you turn away, you know, vacations and food yeah. and... Debt, debt freedom, you know. Right, exactly, exactly, man. So how? So we were talking about your activity, your artistic drive starts coming back up, man. Yeah. And you had a lot of interest and experiences as to the community in Tucson, maybe not being so open towards yeah. a, a new artist. Yeah, and I and I I totally get it. You know, I tried to reach out to some people, get some apprenticeships going, but at this point. For me, I was like almost 30 at that time. And I was like, one, like I couldn't, the typical apprenticeships, like they just wanted you to hang out there all day. And yeah, maybe after a year or two years, like then they maybe show you some stuff. And then like, but I'm like, I have bills to pay. I have, like I'm, I'm grown, you know? So if I'm going to step into this, I want to step into it. I don't want to play no games. But that was kind of, that's just kind of the, old school culture that I came across you know right. they're like you're gonna need to just come be a shop bitch for a little bit and I'm like well, sweep the floors yeah, yeah. yeah I was like I get putting in work and I'm never a fr uh, like I don't frown upon hard work but I'm just like well I need to get to business I'm serious about this thing right and so I just didn't really get a lot of feedback and some some artists were really nice about it you know they just didn't have the time or or people but uh yeah, it will. I didn't have any luck in the, in Tucson at first. That's insane, man. Yeah, that's insane. Did you get? I'll, I'll tell you what my 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 biggest frustration is, or I'll first I'll ask you the question: Did you get a straight no, or did you get a dance around the no? My my biggest yeah, problem yeah. is this: like as a business owner, um, my biggest problem is when you have a business proposition, and I want to hear a yes, want to hear a no. Yeah, yeah. But I I don't. Want us? I, I don't want you to take three days to think about this, and yeah. you know, or at least let's start discussing the details of this. But don't leave me like high, and high, and it, yeah. don't don't make me wait. Yeah, you know what I mean. If you if you mm -hmm. if you don't want to do this, or if you have reservations about what I'm proposing, then yeah. tell me. Maybe I'm not explaining myself. Maybe yeah. there's more details to the to this deal that I need to that you don't get. Yeah, but just that you know, I'll give you an example, man. Like matchmaking, you know, mm -hmm. for for the last where you're standing. Yeah. You know, I get this email. It's like, my guys are ready to go. They'll take on anybody, anytime. And oh, really? What about this guy? Ooh, let me get back to you. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like three days later, man. And I'm like, hey, man, like I'm waiting for an answer. Yeah. You know? Um, so that's what drives me crazy. You know, like if you're going to tell mm -hmm. me no, just say no. Yeah, yeah. Don't do that delay just to say no. For sure. And that, I mean, I had actually a, a pretty good experience with people just telling me no kindly. Mm -hmm. Some people were just like, no, straight up. And others were just like, I don't know. They, they, you know, a lot of them felt like they couldn't apprentice anybody. Like they were experienced, but they just didn't have experience teaching, which okay. I understand is a whole different ball game. You know, like right. you'd be good at a craft, but I think there's something special about if you can teach that. The craft. Michael Jordan syndrome, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, people were, were pretty nice about, about it. No one was really ever rude, but they did just say no, you know. And that's was, crazy yeah and so i was just like man almost 30 this passion's in me what do i do what so do I do? where do we go so um actually it was the good old instagram algorithm man like i was uh liking certain styles of tattoos and then on the instagram algorithm they would put you know tattoo artists or tattoo studios across from me and i found this shop in canada called chronic ink and then what happened so um Chronic Ink, um, they're like this world-renowned shop. They specialize in everything. They're just, they're, they're just great at what they do. 
um, but they have put out this um, online like workshop like where you can they were teaching you how to draw and they were teaching you tattoo techniques it was called ink workshops and so they put it out I had never seen anything like it and I was like oh my gosh I started getting some knowledge for drawing some knowledge for tattooing um, and I was just like, dang, this is it. Like I started to actually get a little bit of a taste of like an open door, I guess you would say, even just through this website. Mm -hmm. So um, from that, I reached out to the one of the guys that was in charge of that workshop. And I kind of told him my situation. I just wrote him an email and was like, hey, this is what's going on with me. This is what's happening. Would you ever be okay with me flying up there and learning from you guys? And uh, at first, the, he just kind of came back and was like, we need some compensation. And I was like, give me a number. Give me a number. And uh, after kind of dialoguing back and forth, he was just like, no, nah, man, if you can come up here, like, we we can teach you if you come up. So not even for compensation? Nothing. But for to him, that was the filter. To yeah. him, that was the filter to see how serious you were about this. Exactly. Because I'm I mean? probably sure they get a lot. They get a lot, but so it's so funny, man. Um when it comes down to follow through, there's a big percentage of people that don't follow through. Yeah. But this how the this is how the interaction goes. It's they'll propose something. They'll propose an idea. Man, you have this great idea about this business and you know it's gonna revolutionize this and that. And and this is how it goes. If their idea is flawed or not fully developed and you say no. They can always take that interaction and then go and talk about this negative experience that they have with you. Yeah, dude, man, he's such a this and that. He's, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. But if you say, yeah, you know what, I, I want to hear more. I want to hear more about this. Here's my email. Here's my phone number. Let's meet up for coffee and stuff. Yeah, they'll never follow through. <laughs> but now it's on them because you open up the door. Absolutely, you open up the door. You open up the door to saying, okay, let me hear more about your idea. Let's see how committed you are to, to following this through. Because there's some sacrifices. There are some, there's a lot of sacrifices to be made, right? And that's when it, majority of the time, it ends for people. And this is where you have your majority of people that are bitter and angry talking about the elitist, right? Oh, and, yeah. And, and then this and that, and, and the people that are successful. You didn't follow it through. Yeah. You didn't follow through, and it's and it always falls back to that, you know. So whenever people like approach me with an idea, man, I I'm always <laughs> like, yeah, let's do it, man. Let's meet up for coffee, <laughs> and and you know, and, yeah. and I always use the coffee because to me, it's it's we have to. I, I want to see you. I want to see your interaction. Absolutely. I want to see how far into your idea you've developed this, um, and you have to carve out time of your day. Yeah. It right, takes a step. you have to put down the Xbox controller <laughs> to meet me and and, yeah, and talk yeah. about this. And I want to tell you that ninety five percent of the time it never follows through. I can it's, see it, that. It, it, I can just... really see that. But that's awesome. I love that. I love how the guy was like. At first, he was like, "Oh, we need compensation and this and that." I, I was like, and you and... follow it through, and the guy is like, "Okay, we'll do it for free." <laughs> but but that was his filter, and and I appreciated that too because I it gave me because I didn't have the money. I, to fly out there, I didn't have anything, but I was just believing. Like, if there's an opportunity for me to learn from some of the best in the world, like, I'll, I'm gonna do whatever. Like, I'll sell my car, you know, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll ride a bike to work. And um, I think that's what, what makes the difference for people, you know, if you're willing to, to lay it on the line for something that you believe. Because I think that's when doors open up. But the money appeared. Yeah, I got the money. Right. Um, they actually, it, the way that it worked out is that, you know, I got flown out there the first time. They paid for my flight the yeah. first time. And Dude, that's insane. Yeah. Again, it goes back to that, right? It goes yeah. back to, okay, with this guy passed the, the, the bullshit filter, right? Yeah. This, this guy is getting past his own bullshit to make things happen. And they, so many, so many people get caught in planning, and then they just they they don't see opportunities available to them. Yeah. Because ah, I don't have the money. I don't have the money. But you know, like I'll never, I can't message this guy in in Canada because I don't have the money to fly. It, it, it just start the conversation. You'd be surprised. Yep. And that's exactly you'd what be happened. surprised. I yeah. like literally just I threw a line out to the universe and like caught something you know yeah. but 
if you never throw out a line, you'll never see. see you got to pull can the trigger. Yeah. You got to pull the trigger, man. So what was your experience like staying out there, man? So man. Being, a, being an apprenticeship, what, what was it like? How so, long were you there? So my first time I was out there for a week. Hmm. So I went for a week. That was what I could afford at that time. Um, and then I think later in the year, I went out for like three weeks. And they pretty much like, I was in, I was just blown away. Because when I, from when I stepped in the door, they were willing to give me all their knowledge for free. Wow. And like, they, they never asked for anything, which was, I, I didn't, I had never seen, you know, one, they were like these incredible, like high caliber artists that are just super successful in this industry and they have no clue who I am. They let me walk in the door and, you know, the lead artist, when I first got there, he's like, Ask me as many questions as you want. Take video. Video is probably better. You can take it home and look at it. And he, he was just teaching me drawing stuff. And then the other artists come in and um, start teaching me and helping me and showing me. And it, I, I literally felt like I was in a dream. I was like, this, how are these people this nice? Like, <laughs> Right. Well, you don't have to know the person always, man. Sometimes you just know when somebody's your tribe. Yeah. You know, like, like this guy is my, this guy's part of my tribe. This guy is my energy. I, mm -hmm. I love what this guy is doing. Let me give him everything. Yeah. And, it, and yeah, for when I was there, I was pretty much like, I would just go back to my the hotel that I had rented or whatever. And I just like stare at the wall and be like, is this really happening? Like, what? I'm a firefighter at that point. I had the time I could take off because of the schedule. And I was just like, is this like, is this really opening up for me in a way that like I would have never considered opening up, you know? Because you think like you have to do this traditional apprenticeship. Right. And, and I only knew the American way, you know, like how they did it. And for me to walk in and then to be just like, yeah, come back every year. Like, come back. Like, well, you know, you keep learning. And did keep you feel? Growing. Did you feel you deserved it? And the reason I, I ask you yeah. is this because uh -huh. the reason I ask you is this: like everything that we're talking about, it just goes into like a series of things that I believe, man. And number one is the universe will answer your your needs if yeah. you're true about your intentions. Yes. Right. Yeah. You didn't have the money. The universe created that money. Yeah. You know, but you threw it out there and. and you contacted this guy and yeah. you pass you pass the bullshit test. You know, yeah. you show that you were determined and driven to make things happen. Yeah. So not only did you not have to come up, they, they flew you up there, yeah. right? And then number two is sometimes people don't feel they want it, but they don't feel the serving of yeah. it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. how 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 are you at thirty deserving to be flown and then taught this level of artistry you know what i mean yeah so yeah and the reason and the reason i worded that way is because it's not that i'm saying you don't deserve it is people sit there and they go i don't deserve to win yeah yeah i haven't done enough to deserve to win where it's mm -hmm. like get out of your own way man and accept the blessings of the universe man exactly and i'd probably have to say the answer to that question is i think it probably comes down more to my core belief of humanity rather than like if I deserve it or not. Because did I think I deserved it? No, but it wasn't because I was bad or incapable. Be I, I guess I would say because my core belief about humanity is that we're all good. And I think if we want to step into like truly our true self and who we really are, like, yeah, you deserve it. Because that's, I feel like we all have a piece to give to this world. And when you can find it, like, well, yeah, you deserve it. And that is true human nature. And and that's that how is, I feel. That, like, that's you know? how I feel. That's that's what I truly feel too, man, is that the true hum, human nature is that deep down inside, when we're not scared, yeah, and we and when we're not scared and we're not in that survival mode, we can we have the ability to show that kindness. Yeah. You know? We have, we show the ability to show that kindness and start caring for other people. Yeah. Start sharing, man. And I felt like it was just like I blossomed later in life because I think I lived in that survival mentality for, for so soul. long yeah. that it was, it took me, you know, that, that hierarchy you were talking about, like it took me getting in this place where I felt like my needs were met from the fire department. Like mm -hmm. it was a stable job. I had this stable income that I was actually given space to explore. Like, what am I? Who yeah. am I? And basic needs have to be met at, at different levels, man. Like, I think that uh, for somebody, 
Like it didn't have to be the fire department. You know, it could you yeah. can be a young kid that just gets a job at KFC, mm-hmm. and you get to meet those little needs that you may have to allow your creativity to start flowing again and start getting back to what's important to you. Yeah. You know, like I don't want, you know, I don't want to put a, like a, I think the, the biggest risk is to put a monetary value to what those needs are. You yeah. Know? Like saying, well, I have to make 45 to, you know, $50,000 a year to have my needs met. It's, it, yeah. it's not true, man. You know, mm-hmm. it's not true. It's like, you don't need, you don't need the, the $200,000 home, you know, or the or the seventy five thousand dollar vehicle to have those meets. You know, yeah. you need yeah. you need a a shit little apartment with a thousand dollar car. <laughs> Absolutely, that yeah. gets you to or from shit. Not even a car, maybe even a mm-hmm. bike, like you said. Yeah, but that's a basic way of meeting your needs and get going, man. Like it's not. Yeah, yeah. people it's, put like this high value number on what those needs. And and I think it's like that perspective thing. Like when people can get in that perspective, like. That what society tells us success is or, or what society tells us like that when we're being successful like when we can shed that and just be like all I need is to be here and breathing and alive and I think when we can get that it just took me a little later <laughs> right to get it yeah. that uh yeah it can start today for somebody you, you, know? you can it takes it takes a little bit to deprogram yourself yeah. from that right mm-hmm. especially with culture today just Oh no! And I don't want you to say cultures like pop culture being shoved down your throat, right? Oh, like man. you need the biggest, you, need, the you best. need this shoes, you need to dress like this, you need to wear this clothing. You know, you need, you need, you need, you need. Yep. And the only way that they're going to convince you that you need that shirt, those shoes, is by making you feel already less than what you are. Which is horrible. <laughs> right. It's but that's the only way it's going to work. Yeah. It's the only day it's going to work, man. Hey, you want to look cool like Migos over here? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You need yeah. this. You need this t-shirt, you know, and it's in reality. It's like, you don't need that, man. You know? Yeah. And, I, and I think that for me, coming from the music that influenced me so much, it's like all my role models were black t-shirt and jeans. Yeah. You know, and and it was great because they all had holes in them. You know, and it was, but their meets were were met at a basic level to where they could start expressing themselves, so they could start speaking some truth. And for me, that influenced me hugely. When I was like, okay, that's what that's what I need to meet. You yeah, know? like if I can choose wear a t shirt and shirt, I don't need pop culture to yeah. tell me that I'm less than. Absolutely. But this fucking kids don't get it. <laughs> this fucking kids don't get it, man. You know, these yeah. kids don't get it. They get caught up in that having to look a certain way. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's yeah. and it's not so much on them, um, but it's on the that toxic world of high school. Yeah, and then social media, man. What our technology is putting in front of your eyes and giving you like. Those algorithms, I mean, I have literally just said things around my phone and then all of a sudden sponsored ads are coming up about like this coffee I want to buy or something. This, yeah. These like shoes I've been considering getting and all of a sudden I'm like, are they listening in and just yes, marketing are. to yes, me? Yes, they you are. Know? 100%. And so I can imagine as a young kid just like getting put everything that you think you want and you need and they're just, yeah. they're putting it right there in front of you. As you're scrolling. Dude, so it was, it's crazy because, like, I think at the basic level, like, um, I was reading an interview. It was a Canadian article with the Riza from the Wu-Tang Clan. Oh, uh-huh. Did you read it? it no. he's, he talks about He talks about how in, in junior high and throughout elementary, he was, like, a straight-A student. Yeah, he was in poverty, but he was a straight-A student. Mm, wow. Smart. Smart as hell. He gets to high school, and his grades drop. And he said that the direct, the direct reason for that is all of a sudden he gets to school and kids come up to him and they're like, hey, how come you wear the same shoes every day? Mm. How come that your shirt doesn't have a brand on it? Dang. You know, and then he starts looking at what he's wearing that he was oblivious to all this time. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, shit, I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they put a value. They on put that. a value. Yeah. Well, they he allowed people to dictate what his personal value was, yep. you know. Yep. And then next thing you know, he's like, "Oh shit, man, I need to start selling some drugs here." <laughs> you <laughs> to know, make that money to yeah. make that money to be to have that personal worth, yeah. right? And I can only imagine what it's like now on social media um, to to put value on likes. You oh, know, gosh, dude, 
if you if you ever find yourself like in a public place, like listen to kids talk, like, hey Becky, what happened with like this? You know, with or this with this them, post, yeah. right? What happened with this post? Oh, I took it down. It only got fifty likes. Oh my gosh! And she's like, well, the one before that got like one seventy, and this one got fifty, <laughs> so I deleted it. You know what I mean? Yeah, or like, crazy. or like, did you like this kid? I do, but he only has like a hundred followers. What? Those are, that's the shit that these kids are looking into, man. Yeah, no. I mean, and that's where I feel like the the better that I can be as a person, I think I can impart that kind of perspective to people around me. Like if right. I can cross paths with somebody and put just value on being human, like maybe that can, instead of like how Rizzo was affected by those dudes, like maybe I can just let people know like you, your value is different. There's a different... How do we put value on somebody as a human? That's funny. I was talking about that this morning. Um, and one of the things that I've been really like focusing on is, I don't know what it is about us as humans, but like anytime we see somebody, we like want to categorize them or we, we kind of put them into maybe a box in our head that we have. And it's just a form of judgment. And I want to be, you know, I'm not saying I'm there, but I want to live in a place where I can interact with somebody and not based on how they look, how they talk, I can just see them as being a human. Like, mm. And what it'll do, it'll allow me to be judgment-free with that person so that I can actually be invited into their world, you know, within who they are, but right. that where my judgments would potentially, like, prevent that. Correct. Know? No, that's, that's so powerful, man. I read a quote, and it was talking about and, I, and I'm very guilty of that. I'm, I'm very guilty of having that mindset, like you were saying, especially in my younger years, man, mm -hmm. of, of like Gosh. immediately immediately trying to figure out what box I'm going to put you yeah, in. Sizing right? people up. Dude. Sizing <laughs> people up. You know, you know like si <laughs> sizing people up like, oh, you're, you sound like this and you're, and you're dressed like this, so you're this. And yep. so you go in this box over here, you oh, know? Yeah. But it's also the survival mode. Mm -hmm. it's, also, it's also putting people into categories speaks more about you as a person that you are in survival mode where yep. you immediately have to figure out where that person fits yeah friend or foe yeah you know but this very powerful quote man and he was talking about and he was talking about where the truths come from right where the truths come from and i'm gonna and i'm gonna mention a couple of people that to me like it's i i love who they are like uh willie uh from uh tim planet uh -huh. um, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, and um, and uh, Burchek, they have a style of communication very different to mine. Mm. But they, but if you watch the positive influence they're having on people around them, right, and and they immediately it immediately goes to this quote, right? So if you listen to, or if you read a quote by Walter Woodman. Right, mm -hmm. one of the greatest writers in America, yeah. and he's spinning some truth, man. And he's Walter Whitman talked about the same tough, the same things that you and I are talking about mm -hmm. right now. But what happens when DMX sounds and looks the way he looks yeah. and the way he sounds, but he's saying the exact same message? You're just not going to listen to it because the way he looks and he sounds, you immediately shut him off. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's where the passing, getting past that visual and that audit, you know that that audio blocks that we put on people yeah. you know just sit there and listen to people a little bit man yeah and like for me too it's like stop the assumptions of people because like i could meet you and you could be having the shittiest day and you could be like just going through life and it could be piling on you and just because you're in a bad attitude or a bad mood towards me i'll shut you off when there's an opportunity for me to just maybe speak into you encourage you like help your day take a different turn. Right. And, you know, for me, I just think about those things where I'm like, dang, like, if someone's being shitty to me, it's probably not me. It's just, they just might be going through life. Right. And I want to stop that's, assuming, you We know? don't, that's, that's, that's so funny, man. We don't allow people to have shitty days. Oh, God. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I met this guy, dude, he was such an <laughs> asshole. And you're like, okay, did, we, did I even stop to, like, analyze, maybe think about what kind of day that person was having? Yeah. You know, we don't allow people to have bad days, man. Like we immediately like, I met him and he was great, or I met him and he was uh, he was a complete shit. Yeah, and like yeah. for me, I'm just like, I don't want to be 
Like, I believe that core belief that I'm good and we're all good. And so I want to lead with that. I'm going to stick to that until proven wrong. Yeah. And yeah. then I don't want I don't want to change that because of you, which means like that everybody can change me. And I don't want to live that way. Yeah. I want to be that like thermostat in the room, you know, that, yeah. that changes things, not letting things change me. That's beautiful, man. So, dude, when you're doing this tattoos, man, and you're starting to have these interactions mm -hmm. with people, um, what is it like, man, when people start opening up to like such a crazy personal level and yeah. they're telling you they're telling you yeah. things that they probably don't even haven't told their loved ones, you yeah, know? And it's, it's all wild. tied to the tattoo that you're putting on them. Yeah, it's wild. Like one, I think it's because of the nature of tattooing. Like tattooing is intimate because sometimes they're well, anytime they're exposing their skin to you. You know, they're exposing a part of their body. Right. And they know it's going to be painful. And so I think it's just that physical act of exposing themselves, of being vulnerable. Like people open up and people just share things, whether it's tied to the tattoo or sometimes, you know, we're sitting there for hours and they just share things about their life. And that's the stuff that gets me where because that core belief that I have that we're all good. Like, so I feel like it just makes space for me to be encouraged by that person with what they're going through in life right. or vice versa, you know? And I'm like, there's exchanges that sometimes happen over tattooing that like change my belief system that give me more compassion for people that like, you know, just impact me in ways where I'm just like, this is what it's about. Like, this is what life is about. That's what I love the the setup of your shop. Last time I was there, man, it's almost like a church. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's it's a, it has a very it's it's not it's it has a lot of your art and it has but the lighting and the setup and everything it's uh it's you feel very comfortable, um, and and you kind of start seeing that more towards like modern tattoo artists that they they're getting away from that grimy. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to the shop. So they're like, welcome to hepatitis, you know? And, <laughs> yeah, and you don't want to touch anything. Yeah, you don't want to touch anything. But it's more towards like, hey, welcome to welcome to church, man. Yeah and, and, yeah. and the church in the sense that you're about to have an experience, maybe even have an interaction where you're with you, your tattoo, the pain, and your artist. Yeah. That changes you. And I appreciate that, man, because I really that's why I think I'm going the direction that I'm going right now. Like, you know, I've I've been asked to join some some studios and I've had those opportunities. But like from the way I was introduced to tattooing from, you know, Chronic Inc. in Canada, like I saw something different. Like I saw a community of artists that are just pushing each other and and growing together and that are taking them each other to different heights, artists, um, artistically and it was no competition, you know. There, were, for me, I was in competition my whole life as an athlete. But to not see that, to see this like friendly competition where they're like pushing each other, I'm like, I want to build that here. Yeah. I want to build that kind of environment, that kind of vibe. Um, and yeah, I, I, I have to do it, you know. It takes time because I think that I think that we've struggled with jujitsu mm -hmm. doing that, right? Like yep. the, the, the competition, and I think that sometimes when you when you walk into a room and you start talking the way we're talking, people are yeah. like, all right, you got the bullshit. Like, really, what do you want? You yeah. know? And you're like, yeah. no, no, dude, I'm being honest about my intent. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, I want to build this community and, and, you know, and you start doing your spiel about how you want to change the world and people yeah. are like, no, seriously, what do you want? Like, you know? Yeah, what's your goal? <laughs> what's your goal? What's your what's your end goal? Like, yeah. are you trying to close down this gym? And it's like, no, dude, I, I don't want to close down any gym. I want all gyms to be successful. Yeah. And I want... And I, you know, there's no, no, I'm no better than you. You're not better than me. You have your own journey. I have mine. Yeah. We all have our own personal demons to conquer and challenges. Yeah. And the competition is truly versus yourself. Absolutely. You know? And yeah. so if we could really, like, if we could, if we could really convince people that we're honest about that drive yeah. and get more people on board, I think we would we would uh um be have a little bit more participation to that into that vision you know absolutely I but would. but insecurity starts sipping in right because you know you go to a tournament your guy wins so yeah of course you got to celebrate your your person's victory absolutely, you know yeah. but then but then that starts leading into what does that mean what does that mean when when you're when you lose yeah. when your student loses you know yeah. what does that mean to you as a as a as an instructor you know yeah and uh, and and 
and it truly doesn't mean anything like to me like i my job as an instructor is to create the best possible training scenario for you to receive knowledge and grow as an yeah. athlete and grow as a person um, help you in the process of becoming a better human, which leads into becoming a better jiu-jitsu practitioner, and help you with the application yep. of this knowledge, right? Which is the competition. But at the end of the day, man, you're the one responsible for the application of this knowledge, mm -hmm. you know? And and you win, and I celebrate with you, but I don't take your victory from you, yeah. right? Yeah. And when you lose, I feel for you, but also I don't take on that loss either. Yeah. I take it in the sense of, okay, where did you mess up in application? Because I know we've covered how to get out of that position. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. It's just you failed to <laughs> apply that, right? Yeah. But if we could if we can understand that instead of just being so like, oh, your guy your guys beat my guys. So I'm gonna lose students, you know? Yeah. You shouldn't lose students. I mean, if you have a good relationship with your students, then your students understand that, yeah. you know. So same thing with tattooing, man. If we could create that, you know, that community of, of getting past that ego. Yeah, and it, I have a funny story from the first time I went down to Canada. Um, because I think it's like, it's hard when people, even with jiu-jitsu, like, I think there's like a scarcity mentality where we believe that there's like limited resources of money, of people, of things. And we're just like, if you're successful, then it takes away from me. But man, when I first went up to Canada, I was sitting with the, the lead artist and he was telling me this story. And uh, he was like, yeah, people will come and they'll get a sleeve from me. They'll get it all lined. And uh, then they'll take that, the line work that I do and they take it to another artist to go get shaded. And one time an artist took his design he drew up that they shaded, they entered it in a competition and they won. Mm. And and he when he tells me this, he starts laughing. And I'm just like, oh, wait, I wasn't expecting him to start laughing. Okay, okay, yeah. And That's... he's just, he he's like, it's okay. He's like, there's enough money in the world. There's enough people in the world. And it always works out. And that has stuck with me ever since. Just let it go. Yeah, just let the ego go. He's yeah. just like, let it go. He's like, it, he's like it's always going to come back. And I mean, he's booked out for two years. Like... So and he's not hurting for that sleeve and yeah, that award. And he's, yeah. li and he's actually living in it, you know, because he started 10 years ago where it wasn't like that. People weren't knocking down his door, but right. he kept that mentality of like, there's always enough. There's, there's, there's more. more than enough. There's more. And I think that's something that I want to like just have around me, that mentality of like, there's more than enough. Like if you're successful as an artist, it doesn't take money away from me. It only builds right. me up. Like it'll push me. To be like, dang, you can take it to those limits. Like, all right, let's go. You know, like let's keep going. Right. And so, yeah, man, it's 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 a it's something that's gonna take time. But I'm like, I'm willing to to put that time in. You know. I was recently part of um, like a gathering of the minds, man. Um, Brittany Palmer, who's a student of us, but and she's a realtor, but she's also has her fingers in like so many things that are going on in the community. Mm, okay. And she put this little thing together where it was just a bunch of business owners uh, get together and talk about how can we better Tucson, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I think that we need to, so we just had our first meeting and uh, I think we're gonna try to meet every two weeks. So I'd love to be, I'd love to have you part of oh, that. Oh, that would be great. And, that would be awesome. And, and I think that regardless of Regardless of what background people bring into them, and I think that you know we need people that are invested into into making this world better. Yeah. Through whatever, through whatever voice you might have, or through whatever um, passion you pursue. You know. I think yeah, I think it's important because I think we don't have to figure it all out and know exactly the way, but I think just like we were talking about earlier, like throwing a line out there with the good right. intention. And I think things will open up, you know, things will happen. Yeah, and like you said, man, like to be a role model, I don't think you need to have all the answers, <laughs> you know, but you can choose. I think that you, if you can show the flaws in your character, but yet show your success yeah. at the same time, like, hey, kid, like, look, look man, I'm I'm just as fucked up as you are. Yeah, you I'm know? figuring it out. <laughs> but I'm figuring it out, but I'm not letting my flaws hold me back. That's it. You know, I'm not letting my That's flaws it. hold me back. And, and I'm trying to... And, and I speak of a truth that I'm seeking, acknowledging that I'm not there. Yet. Absolutely. Like, yeah. You know, like we're talking about getting past, 
getting past physical mental barriers. But I guarantee <laughs> when I have coffee and then look at some guy, I'm gonna be like that motherfucker. You know? <laughs> yeah. And then you catch yeah. yourself, you're like, nope, no, nope, don't do that. Don't I have do that. No clue about that person. <laughs> right. Yeah. But that's that's the biggest thing, man, is to start being a role model. There's a there's a phrase um, that's being used through uh, We Defy, mm-hmm. uh, which is this wonderful organization that helps veterans. Yeah. And uh, and it's and it says, jujitsu is not the answer, but it can lead you to the answer. Yes, that's it, man. You know, there's tons of there's tons of different ways that that are tools to help us all connect. And whether it's jujitsu, tattooing, art, art like, yeah. and I think when we're doing that, like that's that quotes it, like. Yeah. But it can lead you to the it can answer. Lead you to it. it can yeah. lead you to the answer because it gets you going. It gets you whatever whatever it is like art. Tattooing and art might not be the answer, but in the process, it'll lead you to the answer. Yeah. One of the many answers that you need in your life. Absolutely. You know, so, um, but yeah, man, I'm excited about things that are happening here in Tucson. I'm excited about things that are happening in the community. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that we finally got to do this. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's not wait like another year to do uh, it again, for man. For sure, man. But uh, dude, what, what else you got going on? What's, uh, what's in the works? So right now I am... I'm in the process of that building. You know, I want to build a team. I want to create a culture. Um, so I have an apprentice right now. Um, and uh, as things open and roll, I'd like to get more apprentices or bring on other artists and just create that, like, vibe. You know, create that kind of energy. Um, and nothing against what anybody else is doing. It's just that's what, this is what I feel called to do. So yeah. I'm going to yeah, I'm gonna start building start building a team and seeing what happens all right man talk about your shop where where can people find you what's your yeah what's I'm your a- ad man i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> uh, so i'm i'm a private studio but you can find me um near first and river uh my instagram is bushido studio az as well as my website bushido bushido studio az.com uh you can <clears throat> you can get in touch with me there um or just you know hit me up and come check out the shop Awesome, man. Thank you for doing this, brother. Hey, it's a pleasure. Awesome, man. <laughs> Thank you.